Welcome to today's webinar on Kubernetes and Azure Cloud Kits for Vaadin Flow. Um, today, we're going to get you into a little bit of the details of how it works and, and show you a demo of some of the aspects of those cloud kits. Today, as speakers, we have Tarek Orabi, who is our product manager for the Azure and Kubernetes Cloud, the Azure Net sorry, Azure Cloud and Kubernetes kits, excuse me, and Marco Colavati, who's one of our senior software engineers who was involved in creating those kits. So before we get started, um, let's do a few housekeeping items today. Um, your lines, as you've probably noticed, are muted during the webinar. Uh, to ask questions, if you go to the lower right corner of your screen, there's a questions panel, and you can put any questions in there, and you can put those in at any point during the webinar. So as you think of something, feel free to put it in there. Uh, we'll take the questions in general at the end of the webinar, unless we see something that we can address as we go through. But in general, we'll wait till the end of the webinar. We'll also be using in the lower right corner, uh, we'll do in a moment some polling questions. So there's also a polls icon down there as well that you can use. We will send everybody a link to the slides and the recording within 24 hours after the webinar so that you can review that or share that internally with other folks. So before we get started on the content today, I just wanted to remind people, uh, some of you may be less familiar with Vaden. But Vaden is really focused on helping organizations to build and modernize applications that are based on Java more quickly and more cost effectively. And we do have two different frameworks that we offer for you to be able to do that. Vaden Flow, which is really our flagship uh, framework that many of you may be familiar with, is focused on full stack Java, enabling Java developers to deliver a modern uh, UX using our components and our design system and our, our framework capabilities. Um, Hilla is a second framework that we offer. This is really focused on folks that want to have a reactive front end uh, with a Java back end. Uh, just to note, in December, we also re released for Hilla React support meaning that if you want to use React, you can use Hilla alongside of that. Uh, you can leverage our components in that React environment. And also we provide some additional capabilities that make it faster to develop than with just React alone. So if you haven't checked out Hilla and you have that use case, please, please try that as well. Um, so with that, let's talk, uh, do a few polling questions. Um, so we want to get a better sense of you, the audience, and what your situations and needs are. So if you want to go down to the lower right corner and click on polls, the first polling question is available. Once you submit a vote, you can see the results right there on the screen. So the first question uh, lets you choose multiple answers. Um, so where does your organization deploy your Java-based applications? And you can select more than one. Um, so whether on-premise, uh, one of the public clouds, or if you don't know or not sure or none of the above, you can just pick the not sure option. Make sure you hit the submit vote button because then you can see the results that everybody's putting in. And these will update in real time as people get their votes in. So, so far we've got almost half of you have voted and 52% of you, over actually over 50%, it's growing, uh, deploy applications into your own data center on premise. 22% uh, are going into AWS, 15% into Azure, um, and then a smattering of the other answers. All right, thanks for responding to that. We're gonna now do a second polling question and this one is specifically about Kubernetes, whether you're using Kubernetes or not. Um, this has a long list. So again, you can select more than one option and uh, you have to scroll down to see all the options at the bottom, potentially, depending on your screen. If you're not using Kubernetes, there's an option for that as well. Um, so again, check all of the options that are relevant for your organization and then you can go ahead and submit the vote and we can start to see the results coming in there. Um, so we've got almost half of you voting already so far. So about 40% are not using Kubernetes. Um, so that means the rest of you are, or there might be some of you, a few of you are not sure. So about half of you are either not or not sure. 
Um, and then 13% are using Kubernetes deployed on-prem, 8% of you using one of the Azure services, about the same using AWS services. Uh, some are doing self-managed Kubernetes in the cloud, a few of you using things like OpenShift and uh, Google Cloud as well. All right, great, thanks for that. And we have a third and final poll so the third and final poll is um, what challenges do you face when deploying Java applications to cloud and Kubernetes? Again, you can select more than one. Uh, if you wanna see the answers, but you're not using it, you can just pick not sure as your answer or pick other as your answer. Um, so the ability is your challenge, scaling the application up, but also down, implementing high availability and failover, updating the application once it's deployed without having any downtime, making the Java application serializable, getting your cloud and Kubernetes environment configured or other. Uh, so select again any that apply to you and then make sure you hit the submit vote so you can see the answers. So right now we've had half of you have responded. Um, updating the application without any downtime is the top one, closely followed by high availability and failover, uh, scaling up and down, and then further down is the getting the Kubernetes environment configured and making it serializable. All right, great. Thank you so much for participating in our polls. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Tarek, who's going to give you an overview of what's in these two kits. Thank you, Kim, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, and so with the introduction of Vaadin 23.3, which was uh, introduced or released in uh, December 2022, uh, among other things, we had two new kits, Kubernetes and the Azure Cloud Kit. And what I would like to describe to you today is an uh, overview of what these kits are doing and uh, what kind of benefits that uh, organizations would be able to get out of them if they were uh, to use these two kits. And also we will have a demo that uh, show uh, these the capabilities of these kits in action. Uh, so to start, just to give you a summary of what, uh, what my presentation will include, uh, uh, that these two kits are enable Vaadin flow applications uh, that are used in production to be deployed to Kubernetes and to Azure Cloud. And both kits uh, have several capabilities and the most important of them is the ability to uh, enable horizontal scalability and that is the ability to scale up and down uh, according to, to the demand and also to enable high availability to ensure that the application continues to function for end users uh, even in case of unexpected failures. Uh, third, uh, both uh, both kits enable uh, non-disruptive rolling updates. So that is the ability to introduce new updates in up to applications in production without any uh, downtime and without also disrupting the experience of end users. Uh, in addition, so both kits share these three capabilities. In addition, the Azure Cloud Kit also have the added uh, uh, functionality of making it easier to specifically deploy to Azure uh, Cloud using uh, infrastructure as code blueprints. And I'll come uh, to what this infrastructure, infrastructure as code uh, blueprints exactly uh, uh, include. And, and to emphasize both kits, as I mentioned, they were released with Vaadin 23.3. And for the moment, they, they are only supported for Spring Boot apps. Uh, but in the future, also, we are looking into extending the support to, to other uh, stacks as well, non-Spring Boot based as well. And, and the key benefits from both kits are that they reduce cost, they help you increase your uh, team's productivity, they increase your operational resilience, and also increase the agility of your business and the ability to respond to the business need uh, to, to the needs of your business uh, more quickly. And here again, this is to emphasize uh, the same set of capabilities that I just described and, and to, to spell them out in a bit more detail, horizontal scalability would enable uh, your team and your organization to save on cloud costs by allowing you 
to scale up, of course, and also importantly to scale down uh, uh, without impacting active users and thereby would enable you to manage your, uh, your deployment uh, or, or your cloud hosting costs. And second, high availability also enabling end users to continue uh, to use their sessions without experiencing any inter interruption and, and without, uh, without having to uh, lose their, uh, their, uh, any of their work in progress. So for them, uh, the, the experience will be seamless. And non-disruptive rolling updates, as I just described, is that it's the both kits enable uh, the possibility of upgrading uh, the application uh, in production, again, without disrupting the user experience. And finally, one thing that, uh, that, that added to this, I, I mean, this is a sort of a secondary capability in that the, the, we have, the both kits include serialization helpers. And these serialization helpers, of course, because Vaden flow is stateful, uh, the, in order to maintain user session, the, the, the information that's included in the user session, it's important to serialize uh, those sessions and to store them in a common storage that would then be retrieved in case of failure or in case of scaling down events. And in order to make the application serializable, that involves some effort, but both kits include serialization helpers that uh, facilitate uh, uh, this, this effort. So it makes it much more easier, as we will see in today's demo, to actually make the application serializable and ready for uh, to enable horizontal scalability and, and high availability. This is again the same set of capabilities, but in table format. Uh, so both kits enable non-disruptive rolling updates, scaling up and down, high availability, failover, serialization helper. The only difference is that uh, Azure Cloud Kit has the added uh, capability of uh, infrastructure as code blueprints that makes it easier to provision uh, the necessary infrastructure, cloud infrastructure specifically for Azure Cloud. And of course, that, this means that uh, the Azure Cloud Kit is, is, is specifically suitable to, for deployments to, to Azure Cloud and specific to Azure Kubernetes service, uh, whereas the Kubernetes Kit is either uh, suitable for on-premise uh, deployments of Vaden Flow applications, on-premise Kubernetes deployment, or possibly to any other public cloud. So it can be deployed to any public cloud that supports Kubernetes like AWS, Google Cloud, or even if you have a multi-cloud uh, 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 setup that also can, uh, the Kubernetes kit can, can work with that. Just briefly uh, as an overview, this is a very simplified diagram of, of the of the both kits architecture so i whenever i'm speaking about the kits i'll speak about them in the same way if there is distinction i will i will highlight that but this is a simplified diagram of the architecture it's uh, it's mess, mainly missing the load balancer which uh, which is needs to uh, be configured with sticky session to enable the same users to be uh, directed to the same server but what you have here what both kits do is that they store Vaden session which is the, the the java object that's holding the state of user interaction with the flow application that this Vaden session is stored in a common distributed cache so it can be hazelcast or redis and uh, and, and this is under normal circumstances is continuously happening. So Vaden Flow server with the kits, they will automatically install the, uh, or sorry, uh, sync or, 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 or save these Vaden sessions in the distributed cache. Specifically how this works with the situation of scaling up, that's, that's standard and it's, it's actually quite straightforward, uh, just uh, you add the new resource, you add a new Vaden server, and new users will be automatically uh, directed to this uh, new server. So, so that's the easy part of, of the kit. And that's actually something that uh, it has, uh, that, that, that has, is already being uh, deployed in many uh, organizations today. What is uh, quite more tricky than the, actually the state of scaling up is scaling down. Uh, and, and, uh, and here, this is uh, 
a significant value of both kits because when you're if you want if you have a server uh, that you don't want anymore that so you have uh, 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 users that are already connected to this server what these kits now are enabling is that you just kill the server and users of course will be automatically connected to these other uh, or uh, existing active servers but uh, what the kits do also is to ensure that the user session so whatever uh, work in progress they had is is saved so so that for the experience for the end user they don't see anything, they wouldn't even notice that anything has happened at all. And a similar also situation occurs when uh, there is a, uh, a fail failure in, 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 one of the, in one of the servers. So again, if users were connected to one server and this server fails or if the net or the connectivity to this server unexpectedly goes down, then also the same mechanism happened. The Kubernetes or the Azure Cloud Kits will retrieve the Vaden sessions of these users from the uh, distributed cache, say from Hazelcast, and uh, then serve uh, the, the user and the user wouldn't notice that anything has happened. So for, from the end user perspective, the experience is entirely seamless. So the third, so other than horizontal scalability, high availability, the third capable, key capability of both kits is non-disruptive rolling updates. And of course, rolling updates is, is a way of deploying changes to web apps uh, without any downtime and without disruption, importantly. And well, the alternative for this is to have a full scale all at once updates that would just uh, kick, like be very disruptive to, to, the, to the experience of end users or to, schedule, or to uh, schedule a downtime. And that also involves uh, the need to take the system offline for a period of time and deploy the changes, uh, which can be inconvenient for both for users and for the teams uh, updating these systems. But with the Kubernetes and the Azure Cloud Kit, we have non-disruptive rolling updates. So the ability to update the systems without any downtime and without disrupting the end user experience. And you do this by, uh, basically you deploy the updated version of of the application and you have both the existing version and the updated version at the same time and the user of the users that are connected to the existing version are shown a notification telling them hey there is an updated version finish your work in progress save your work and click here so that you are directed to the to the updated version uh, so in that way it's it's you don't need the downtime. You don't need to disrupt the the, the experience of of, or you don't need to disrupt the the, the, the work in progress of the users, uh, and also you don't have to. Uh, uh, yeah, as I said, like you don't need uh, any downtime for this. Then comes the the part that's specifically uh, only applicable for uh, the Azure Cloud Kit, which is the infrastructure as code part and if in case someone is not familiar with the concept, infrastructure as a code is, is a way to describe and provision cloud infrastructure, uh, infrastructure using code. So you just describe, you write a code, and this code is sort of a template that tells, hey, I want these kind of resources, I want these kind of servers, storage, whatever, network connectivity, security, and so on. And then you, with a couple of, literally with a couple of commands, you are getting then the, the infrastructure provisioned. So the Azure Cloud Kit uses uh, uh, an infrastructure as code library called Terraform. And it is a very popular infrastructure as a code tool. And it uses declarative language to, prov to provision infrastructure. So, so as I said, with literally a handful of commands, you can provision the Azure Cloud infrastructure needed to run Vaden Flow apps. And, and these, of course, blueprints are customizable, so you can customize them to be uh, specify the number of, of uh, Kubernetes nodes and pods that you want, the specs of these virtual machines that are running the nodes, uh, the geographical location of the nodes, and so on. And, uh, and this, these blueprints and the, uh, the, the Azure Cloud Kit uh, blueprints enable, uh, enables you to manage uh, infrastructure and in a version controlled way and an automated way. It also ensures a consistent and predictable infrastructure uh, that makes it 
like easier to to manage and maintain the the infrastructure uh, uh, over time and also it, of course it saves and re uh, time and reduces errors of course you don't have to go through tens of of different consoles and figure out how to to provision every single thing uh, uh, in in the uh, in the cloud for the for the cloud provider in this case for for the azure cloud so that's that's all I have to say for now. And now it's demo time, and I give it to Marco to take it from here. Marco, go ahead. Thank you, Tarek. Let me share my screen. Okay, and you can start with the demo of the Kubernetes kit features. We have this simple loading application. It's spring based. You have a public view with this counter that is stored as a field of the view. You can interact with it. And uh, these buttons also are using uh, services that are injected by Spring. And we also have a login, we can enter our credentials. And then we can access a protected page that, that is visible only to authenticated users. What we have to keep in mind is that uh, the state and the, the UI state and the authentication states are uh, stored in the HTTP session. So if, uh, for example, the, the server crashes and is replaced by another instance, we will lose our state and also the, the user will be logged out. What we, will, what we will see with this demo is how Kubernetes Kubernetes can uh, um, can handle these uh, these issues by persisting the HTTP session on a distributed storage. How it uh, can help uh, in detecting serialization issues during development, and how we can how it can handle uh, application upgrades in a user user friendly way. So you can start adding the it to our project, to our Java project. It's a have a dependency, you can reload it. And the first uh, thing we will do is to check if our application is uh, serializable or not. So we can activate the serialization helpers with two properties. Important thing we have to set to JVM parameters. We need to allow reflection on Java your package, and we also need to enable extended debug info for Java serialization. We can now start our application. Okay, we can go back to the browser. And as you can see, now we have this uh, notification that is telling us that this view is not serializable. We can go back to the ID and in the server logs, there are a lot of information about uh, the serialization issues. You can start from the first one, for example. You can see we have a no serializable class is found. The first one is a is a reference to a Lambda expression. And you can see that is store referenced by the counter view at log entry field. So you can open the class and check for it. Here it is. And it is a consumer. And we know consumer is not serializable. And for example, you can simply add replace it with a serializable consumer that is an um, interface provided by Vadin Flow. It is a consumer and also serializable. Let's see. Let's go to the next issue. We have also a reference to a counter service instance that's not, that is not serializable. It's counter view. The field is counter service. And this service is injected by Spring, so we can simply 
inject the stringent and the Kubernetes kit will take care of injecting the field again during the serialization, after the serialization. This should be enough. We can go to the next issue. Here we have also reference to this authenticated user class that is also not serializable. This time it is in main layout. The authenticated user field. This component is also injected by Spring, so we have the same fix. And now go to the next. Okay, it seems okay. We can restart the application. Let's go back to the browser and go to the page. We still have an issue. We can check it. Okay, we still have a reference to a counter service, but this time it is captured by a lambda, a lambda expression. The lambda is defined in the counter view class. So let's go back here and taking a look at the at this information. It seems like it is a click listener. So let's inspect the code, and we can see that. We have this button that is used, that is taking the reference to, count, to the counter service parameter. We know it is not serializable, but we can just access it from the view class that should be serializable. Let's recompile the class and go back to the browser. Now there are no other issues. You can try to navigate. Our application, login view has no issues. The protected page, no issues. Okay, seems like we are okay. Our application has now a session that is serializable. We can now go ahead. Let me just and the next step will be. Um, set up the distributed storage. I have already a branch with the required sources. For this demo, we are going to use uh, Azurecast because you can uh, deploy it uh, with our application and the application will start uh, an Azurecast, in Azurecast instance. Azurecast has also out of the box uh, support for Kubernetes. We just need to create some uh, resources so that uh, every instance can uh, use Kubernetes API to find other members of the cluster. And then, of course, we need to tell the Kubernetes kit that we will use uh, Azurecast as the distributed storage. So let's deploy this. Kubernetes resources. Oops, sorry. Service. Okay. Now we can deploy our application. Let's move to another. First, we need to build our application for production. And while it is building, and take a look at the, at the code. Uh, after we have the artifact created, you can. We have, yeah, we have to create a Docker image. It is simple Docker file. And then we will have a deployment manifest and a service to create in Kubernetes. And we will also create an ingress rule for load balancing 
and we will use a sticky session so that uh, every uh, the request from a, a browser will always be uh, routed to the same uh, server. Okay, we have now our application. You can build our Docker image. We tag it as version one. And you can push it to a local Docker registry that is accessible by Kubernetes. We can now create our deployment resource. Check that our pods are running. It also the ingress rule. Okay, and now back to the browser, you can access our application on Kubernetes. As you can see now, the host name is the name of the pod and the application is running. You can now simulate a downscale or a server failure, but by simply deleting this, this pod. Okay. And if you go back to the browser, you can see that the state is preserved, but we are running on a different pod now. We can also try to sign in. Okay. And you can, for example, delete the pod again. We can continue to use our application and we are still logged in. As you can see, the user is still logged in. Okay, so we have seen that with Kubernetes Kit, our session is uh, persisted in the distributed storage. And in case of failure, the user can continue to, to use the application. We can now move to the last part of the of the demo and we are going to change a little bit our application in this case we, we are just changing the theme colors and we will deploy a new version alongside the, the other one we will create a, a new ingress rule for the version two of our application we're using the canary feature so that uh, every new request will be routed to the new version of the application. So let's start with building the application again. This will take some time. Just a few seconds. Okay. We can build the version two of our Docker image. We can push it to the Docker registry. And we can create deployment for version two of our application. And now you can see we have the four pods of version one that are running and the also four pods for version two. Let's create also the 
Study rule. Okay, and now you can open another browser and try to navigate our application. And as you can see, the colors are different. This, uh, the first browser is still using version one, but the other browser is using version two of our application. We can now edit the ingress rule for version one so that the user will be notified about uh, the availability of a new version of the application. Okay, you can, as we interact with the application, you can see this notification that tells us that the version two is available, but you can still continue working on version one. And when we are fine, you can just click the, the link and now we are on version two. Once uh, all our user are on version two, we can simply just delete all uh, resources, resources Kubernetes resources related to version one of the application. And that's uh, all for this demo. I give the floor back to Tarek to continue the presentation. Thank you, Marco. And, uh, and yeah, and, and just to, to emphasize, uh, the documentation includes step-by-step uh, -step instructions about everything that was included in this demo. And so if you are not familiar with Docker or Kubernetes and ingress rules and so on, don't worry. I mean, there's detailed explanation in, in the documentation about how to use those things and how to customize them for your own uh, need as well. So, uh, yeah, so just to summarize uh, the, the key benefits of, uh, or so as we, we saw that we have uh, both kits, Kubernetes kit and Azure Cloud kit enable horizontal scalability, high availability, and non-disruptive rolling update. And again, Azure Cloud Kit has the added functionality of, of these Terraform uh, infrastructure as code helpers that would enable uh, or facilitate deploying to Azure Cloud. And, and both kits actually enable teams to uh, manage costs. So they, they both help you reduce the total cost of ownership of flow apps in production by enabling you to scale them up and down as needed to optimize costs. They also increase uh, a team's productivity by re reducing the time spent on managing infrastructure and allowing you to focus on building features and improving the product rather than uh, 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 worrying about how to deploy applications in production. They also increase operational resilience. They improve the availability uh, and the usability of flow apps by enabling failover and automatic scaling. They increase the business agility, enable your team to respond uh, to change to changing business needs quickly by scaling up or down again as needed, but also by launching, enabling you to launch new features and products faster with, with no downtime as well. And last, this is something that I haven't mentioned before perhaps, which is that also both kits enable you to avoid or at least minimize vendor lock-in. So you, you wouldn't be uh, logged in into specific uh, cloud provider. Uh, so by being able to deploy flow apps uh, either on premise or migrate them to other cloud, because both Kubernetes, both kits are based on Kubernetes as technology and on Terraform, which is the infrastructure as code technology used for the Azure Cloud Kit. And both of these are vendor neutral. So you, you will find that with minimal effort, you can easily migrate between cloud providers as needed. That's all I have for now. And now we, we open the floor for the questions, uh, any question that you have. All right, thanks Tarek and Marco. We do have a few questions in the queue. I wanna first highlight one that came in a little bit earlier in the session that uh, Marco did answer in the question panel, but just so we can share with everybody. So the question was, that whether the serialization helper takes care of HTTP session, i.e. application level session attribute, or only Vodic, Vodin specific session data. So Marco, do you want to address that one? Yeah, sure. Yes, uh, the, the kit is, will uh, serialize all, attribu all attributes in the HTTP session. 
uh, it takes care specifically it has some specific action for what in session but all attributes are, are serialized and uh, the helpers are useful when uh, you have uh, reference to references to spring beans because the the kit will be able to um, inject the fields again on the serial, after the serialization Great. and also uh, as you have seen in the demo we have these uh, helpers that uh, can detect uh, serialization issues during uh, development Great, thanks, Marco. Um, so the, the second question was whether there's costs associated to the two kits and what do those look like, whether it's per deployment, per subscription, et cetera. Um, so the kits are available in two different ways. Um, if you have a prime or an enterprise subscription, you can choose to add on the kits for a fixed cost for the kits and that cost will cover up to five applications. Um, so it's not per developer, per individual application, but for five applications into that cost. If you have more than five, which some of you may, that you would want to use the kits on, then we can kind of discuss what that looks like as you scale up. And then the second option is we rolled out in October a new edition that's really the, the successor edition to the enterprise edition, and it's called the ultimate edition. And so the ultimate edition includes the kits, all of our kits associated with them. So not just Azure and Kubernetes, but also SSO kit, observability kit, swing kit, et cetera. Um, and we do have some options for those of you that might be on Primer Enterprise. If you want more than one of the kits or sometimes even just one of the kits, it could still be cost effective for you to upgrade to ultimate. Um, so your um, account executive can help walk you through the different options there and share those with you. All right, so let's get back to a few technical questions. Um, there was a question about how does the ingress know that there are different app versions? Does it use custom annotations to support the Canary deployment and notifications? So Marco, I don't know if that question is making sense to you. Yeah, I can try to answer. Okay. Um, yes, basically uh, Kubernetes kit is uh, looking for a particular either HTTP either with the um, with the that that has uh, the new version of the application. And it compares with an uh, internal value, so it can it knows if the if it is needed to upgrade, and the the ingress rule is uh, setting this uh, either for us. Okay, great. And then uh, there were a couple more questions. One was. Uh, after switching from version one to two using the pop-up in the browser, the session seemed to be lost because the shown number was back to one. Is it possible? I don't know if this they meant remain in the session when switching between versions, I think is the question. Yeah, I can answer. Um, the counter is a bit uh, particular because it is stored in the view. And as we uh, reload the page, uh, flow will create a new UI. So uh, it is not, uh, we still will have the, the old value in the HTTP session, but in, a, in an old UI. So th this is the reason because uh, it uh, restarts from one, because it is a view, it's a view attribute. Got it. But uh, yeah, the, the session is, uh, it's still, it's still um, the session will still work even if we upgrade the application. Of course, if the if the session is uh, the HTTP session is serializable, if we make some changes on the what in uh, Java classes that um, that are not um, compatible with the old ones, uh, it will not be possible to serialize the, the session and we should start with a new one. Great. 
Okay. And then we had one last question here, which is, can we push the front end app without the back end changes? And they mentioned a Spring Boot back end. Do we need to package them together and deploy them? No, you don't need to package them together. So if you have them separated, that would enable you to uh, upgrade only the uh, push only the front end. So if you the flow UI part, uh, an updated version of this without having to to upgrade uh, the back end. Of course, assuming that there is no back end incompatibility between the two two versions. Okay, great. And we have one more question specifically about AWS and it's which load balancer opt, I assume they mean option for Vaden in AWS. So right now we do not have a AWS cloud kit specifically. Um, we are planning to do that sometime in 2023. We don't have a date for that yet, but the plan would be to essentially replicate the functionality. Now, even in the meantime, the Kubernetes kit, if you are running Kubernetes within AWS, the Kubernetes kit would still apply. What you would be missing that we have in the Azure Cloud Kit is what Tarek highlighted, which is really the deployment uh, configuration blueprints, uh, those Terraform blueprints that we discussed but the Kubernetes kit could still be applied within AWS. So given that, just that context, I don't know, do we actually have a load balancer requirement or recommendation for AWS? I don't think that we do. Yeah. There's no, I don't think there's any specific requirement there. All right, it looks like we've gotten through all of the questions here. So thanks everybody for joining and um, staying through the session today. Um, if you have further questions or you're interested in finding out more about these kits and whether they're right for you, get pricing, ask further questions, get more of a personalized discussion, uh, you can reach out to us, go to our uh, contact us button on our website and then just fill out the information and say that you'd like to learn more or talk about the kits and we'd be happy to set up a call with you um, with our teams to talk to you about your specific circumstances. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.